good morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you're going to watch this video on 2 Timothy and our training series in the next passage, which is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 9. Um, and as you read this passage, read it prayerfully and consider yourselves, because ultimately one of the mistakes we make is when we look at passages like this is what we think about us in relation to them, when actually we should be introspective and considering ourselves as well in this passage, and ultimately pray that if there are these tendencies in ourselves, as chapter 2 verse 25 tells us that God would grant us repentance from these things, that we would become noble instruments, because our passage is about ignoble instruments. But getting into the context, the context hasn't changed from our previous passage, from chapter 2 verses 20 to 26. This is still about the faithful and the faithless, our previous passage, chapters, uh, verses 2 to 26, I mean 20 to 26, was about the faithful, those who cleanse themselves, those who are granted repentance, those who are reliable men, who are qualified to teach others, who are articles of gold and silver, for noble purposes, made holy and useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. And one of the signs of someone being noble is they cleanse themselves from false teaching and the lives that come from it, godlessness, unchrist likeness But they are also the faithless, those whom, who continue in their way, those who, even though you warn them about quarreling and disputing, that's their tendency, and they continue to ruin those who listen to them, who opt for godless chatter, and basically that's false knowledge, proposing knowledge that's contradictory to the gospel, to the Bible, and their teaching is like gangrene that causes death. They are ultimately, in that house analogy, objects of wood and clay for ignoble purposes to be cast out. They're not useful to the master prepared to do any good work. Basically, those are the people that who oppose you, and even though you gently instruct them, God has not granted them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. But they persist in their way. And so they are, as this passage points out, the, the tragic part of, of this larger argument from verse 20 in chapter 2 to chapter 3, verse 9. They are the ignoble instruments. They are the false teachers. And here are the important things to realize. This is how it will be in the last days in which we live. You know this little phrase, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Meaning, we need to realize the last days from Jesus' ascension to his second coming. We live in that period, the now, not yet tension. You can read about that in your leader's notes. But we need to realize that in the last days, not everyone will come to repentance. But many will persist. And so what Paul shows, the difficulty in the last days, we often might think difficulty is just about persecution. But what Paul points out the difficulty is you will find in the congregation, in the church family, there will be people who are lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, treacherous, reckless, swollen, with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Now, I'm not going to expound all these for you, but you can look at these traits and see which ones are surprising to you. But maybe what I want to highlight is, within the family of God, there will be people who have the appearance of godliness. They will be as religious as anybody else. But because they actually reject the gospel of Jesus, they deny its transforming power. They remain sinful. And in fact, as this points out, they increase in it. Their lives, their faith in their life don't match. Or rather put it this way, they're not honest about what they really believe. And so it manifests in their lives. And this is the type of description of person. And Paul says, if you encounter these type of false teachers and those who are taught by them and believe them, he says, avoid such people. Now, when we read avoid such people, we might read it in the sense of saying shun them, hate them, shame them. But in the context of the book, it's more the idea of don't make them part of the mission. Don't entrust the gospel to them, but rather see them as objects of mission and evangelism. They're not part of the family, and you shouldn't treat them as part of the family. You should avoid them in that sense. You should evangelize them, 
share the good news with them, continue to instruct them gently, but ultimately do not put them in positions of responsibility to teach. They are not equipped for it. They are not reliable for it. They're ignoble instruments. They're not faithful men. But from there also points out their strategy. And this is why you should never give them any responsibility but guard the church against them. It's because for among them there are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning but never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Now one little improviso, people might find it offensive when they read the term weak women or little women, but we need to realize this is not a general reference to women just as much, for example, as this men corrupted in mind is not a general reference to men but rather these are categories of people and when he refers to weak women he refers to people who are generally vulnerable and he points out two qualities of someone who's vulnerable burdened by their sins they're morally not strong but also someone who's not yet strong in their faith and belief and understanding they're always learning never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth it's those who are unstable in these two areas that these type of people, these wolves, prey on. That's their strategy. And I think indirectly it's saying, protect these people from these people. Don't give them responsibility. And this might seem overwhelming, but the last part is very encouraging. First, he says, for example, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. Notice, they're disqualified. They're not meant to be entrusted the gospel if they should be avoided in that sense. But look, look, look at this. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was with that of those two men. Now, this is an important point. A couple of things need to be mentioned here. The encouragement is... He's saying to Timothy, look, this happened to Moses. This is nothing new. Because this has happened to any of God's messengers. Anyone who teaches the truth will be opposed by, like the magicians in Exodus, according to Jewish tradition, tradition Janus and Jambres. They will be opponents. Now, some opponents, when instructed gently, will be granted repentance. But others, like Janus and Jambres, will persist in being opponents. So we should expect this. This is nothing new. This is like since the very beginning of the Bible. However, and here's the encouragement, is God will show them up for their folly will be plain to all, as was these two men. Now when you go back to Exodus, you'll discover that up to a certain point, the magicians under Pharaoh could perform the various miracles or wonders that God did. They had the appearance of godliness as if their power was equal to God. But ultimately, God showed them up. As the wonders increased and continued, slowly but surely, the magicians could not copy them anymore and they themselves were put to shame. God showed them to be powerless. And so just looking at the logic of this passage, if you want to put it in the reverse, the encouragement is God will show them up, those who oppose the message of the messenger, but also realize, realize that even though this is an encouragement, realize that they will seek to prey on the weak. So don't entrust these men with any responsibility to teach, but treat them as objects of mission and evangelism. Because if you don't do this, their teaching will lead to ungodliness. And we need to recognize that this is a sign of the last days. And so what do we need to get from this passage? Realize the reality of false teachers. They are among us. They are in every church. And we should recognize, even if you think they're not in your church, eventually they'll come. But also recognize this strategy and protect the weak. Consider your group. Discuss together how you can protect one another. But also have confidence in God's power to show them up. Eventually, that'll happen. But finally, I would say, be introspective as well. As you study this, as you work through this together, ask yourself this question, do you have false teacher tendencies? It's a very important question to answer. Because realize when you go look at verse 26 of chapter 2, false teachers don't know they are false teachers. God needs to show that to them. And pray that God would do that for all of us.
And that, I'd say, is the message of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 9.